Hey everyone, welcome to Hearth of Hymonia. My name is Kate, and this is the third and final video in my series on Roman weddings. I've been doing this series because I got married this past summer, and I actually recorded the videos before I got married, but now I'm releasing them after the fact. So if you haven't seen the other two, and this is your first one, you should know that throughout the video I'm going to be saying when I get married, but that already happened, so just bear with me with that. In this final video, I'm talking about the ways in which I incorporated elements of Roman weddings into my own wedding. My husband and I are both ancient historians, and so we both wanted to include a lot of classical stuff in our wedding, and that's what we did. So I'm gonna be going over in this video three things that I included from Roman wedding customs, and also three that I did not include intentionally, and I'll explain why. So that's about it for the introduction. I hope you enjoy this final discussion on Roman weddings. And as always, you can check the description for the various sources that I'm using and all of that good stuff. So without further ado, let's talk about Roman weddings. Believe it or not, a lot of the customs that we include in our weddings today, I'm speaking for modern America, which is where I live, a lot of these customs came from ancient Rome or have their origins in ancient Roman practice. So I wanted to just point out a couple of things that we still do today that actually come from ancient Rome. The first is engagement rings. Did you know that ancient Romans wore engagement rings? I didn't until fairly recently. It's true, rings were a part of uh, getting married in ancient Rome. It's unclear whether it was just the bride or the bride and the groom, and whether it was an engagement ring or a wedding ring or what it would have been, but it was placed on the left ring finger, just like we still do today. And the reason was that there was a belief that there was a nerve that ran from this finger all the way up to your heart, and so wearing a ring on that finger connected it to your heart and symbolized eternal love and, you know, union and marriage and all of that good stuff. Another thing that we still do today is a lot of brides wear veils. I'm not wearing one, but it is a pretty common practice still today. And the veil, called the flammeum in Latin, was the most iconic piece of Roman bridal costume. It wouldn't have been white, it would have been either yellow or orange, could have even been pink, but it would have been one of the most important aspects of what the bride was wearing on her wedding day. It symbolizes modesty and chastity, and it was also very common for matroni, or married women, to wear veils, so wearing it on your wedding day signified that you were ready to become a married woman, to become a wife, a matrona. Another thing that we do is a lot of times brides will be walked down the aisle by their father or a father figure. Um, sometimes nowadays it's a father and a mother, or just the mother, whatever it is, um, but traditionally the father is the one who walks the girl down the aisle. And typically they get to the front, he shakes the groom's hand and passes off the bride to the groom and then goes and sits down. And this signifies that the bride is transferring from one family to another. In a Roman context, um, they didn't have a ceremony with an aisle as such, um, but the father would have been the one to officially give the bride over to the groom during like the arrangement of the marriage and the process of actually getting the couple engaged, working out what the dowry was going to look like and all of that. Um, so that's something that we do that's kind of a callback to that 
time, and, and that's pretty common in a lot of cultures where there's an official exchange of, you know, property's the wrong word, but a dependent person, because uh, in ancient Rome, women were legal dependents, they were not independent. Uh, they had to be overseen by a legal guardian, so this would have been the official transfer. Of course, it means something very different today, so, you know, we make the traditions our own. And then the last thing that um, we might recognize from ancient Rome is carrying the bride over the threshold. I talked about this uh, a lot in the last video, but I'll recap it here for those of you who haven't seen it. It was common standard practice for the bride to be carried over the threshold of her new house, which would have been her new husband's house, but it wasn't actually... Uh, the groom who would carry her over the threshold, it would have been someone in the wedding procession that was there. This and many other Roman wedding customs was so old that even the Romans didn't really understand why they did it, but they had some theories. Servius theorized that the moment the bride crossed the threshold, that liminal space she was undergoing some kind of transformation. And it's true, she was undergoing a pretty significant transformation. Officially changing families, officially changing names, uh, pledging allegiance to a new set of household gods, uh, losing her virginity, at least in theory, and uh, pretty soon after becoming a mother. Not to mention now having this whole new set of responsibilities as a wife. The threshold is the kind of liminal space. It is that moment of transition from maiden, uh, girl, weirgo, whatever word you want to use to describe her, to then becoming a matrona, a domina, and soon after a mater, a mother. He also theorized that it would be bad form and potentially bad luck to accidentally kick the threshold, which was, after all, sacred to Vesta, a famous virgin goddess, uh, right at the moment when the bride was expected to lose her virginity. Vesta would not look too kindly on her uh, if that were the case. It also would have been just a generally bad omen if for some reason the bride's passage from the outside into the household was disturbed by a kick or even tripping. In order to avoid any of these accidental mishaps, she would have been carried over the threshold. That is Servius's theory. Plutarch's theory is even less appealing to me, and that is that this is a callback to the incident with the Sabine women, where Rome's early founder Romulus set up his city and realized there were no women, so they could not hope to continue the civilization for future generations. He failed to secure marriage alliances with the neighboring civilizations, so he brought them all over uh, under false pretenses, and at his signal, the men jumped out and took all of the women who were predominantly from the Sabine people, but elsewhere as well, and carried them into their houses uh, to become their wives and bear their children. Plutarch says, well, that worked out really well for Rome, so that's why we celebrate that happy occasion, and that's why the bride must be carried over the threshold. Uh, he also said that it's possible that we carry the bride over the threshold to show that she must be put into the house by force, and if she's put into the house by force, then surely the only way that she would ever leave the house would be by force. In other words, she's not going to find other lovers, she's not going to divorce you, she's not going to leave um, because she wants to. She would have to be forced out of the house. She's going to be loyal and faithful to you, her new husband, um, so that's why we have to force her in uh, so that she would have to be forced out if she was going to leave. Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting way to look at things that if you want to you know, not have somebody leave, you have to figure out a way to, like, create some kind of sympathetic magic situation. But to be perfectly honest with you, I'm running on no sleep, and I, I don't really know <laughs> how to interpret that uh, or what terminology to use for that, but it's definitely an interesting thing to think about 
Uh, I'm going to think about this a lot more and maybe we'll talk about it again in a future video, but if you have thoughts about how this would work magically or what kind of like magical or mystical category this might fall into, please let me know in the comments so that I can look at your ideas and mull them over um, as I return to life after wedding planning is over. So those were some theories as to why the bride was carried over the threshold. So you can see that a lot of our own wedding customs come from ancient Rome. Okay, so let me tell you three customs from Roman weddings that I will be incorporating into my own wedding. And the first one is one that I haven't even touched on in this series at all. And that is bringing images of the ancestors to the wedding. If you've been around for a while, you've heard me talk about Roman death masks. If you could afford it, and it would have been a fairly expensive process, when your family member dies, you take a, a cast of their face. These would have been proudly displayed in the house. Again, the, they would have been very expensive, uh, and so they would have been a bit of a status symbol, but also it's just a nice thing to have images of lost loved ones uh, in your house, and they would have been considered uh, still part of the family. Um, so they would have been brought out on special occasions for that family, major milestones. Uh, your son's toga virilis, or initiation into a priesthood, perhaps, family funerals, and of course, weddings. So bringing your ancestors to this event, the Romans did believe in an afterlife and they believed that the ancestors could communicate with them. Um, so even though it was unlucky to get married on any day that was associated with the dead or had anything to do with the dead, that was the restless, unhappy dead that does not have your best interest at heart but your grandparents and great-grandparents want you to be happy, so they get invited to the wedding. So I will be doing this. I was very close with my grandparents on both sides of my family. I was very fortunate to have them in my life, and unfortunately none of them are with us anymore, so I will be representing them through pictures. I'm actually going to use their wedding photos uh, at our wedding, and my fiance's family as well will be bringing pictures of, of their deceased loved ones as well. This is not so much a religious thing for me, it's not really an altar, it's just kind of a nice way to commemorate them, uh, acknowledge the loss that we all feel, and invite them, if their spirits are out there somewhere, invite them to the actual wedding. Although if anyone puts stock in dreams uh, and thinks that dreams can tell us things, then my grandparents have already RSVP'd for this wedding. They told me personally. Okay, the next thing that I'm going to be incorporating from Roman custom into my wedding is elements of the special bridal costume. Now, don't tempt me to wear a historically accurate Roman bridal costume, because I totally would, but no, I will be wearing a regular modern day traditional white wedding dress. However, uh, and I'm cheating a little bit because this is actually going to be not on my actual wedding day, but at another wedding related event, I will be wearing a belt that is tied with the Hercules knot. Because why not? The Hercules knot is a square knot, and part of a bride's outfit would have been to tie a belt around their dress with this knot. It symbolized eternal love and fidelity, strength and all of that, uh, and the groom was the only one that was allowed to remove the Hercules knot. So yeah, I thought it would be fun to incorporate this because it's super super easy for me to add into the list of things that I'm doing. Uh, and it is not a big deal for me to tie a square knot on a belt, so that's what I'll be doing. And the last custom from Roman weddings that I will be bringing into my own wedding day is the taking of omens. No, I'm not going to stand outside and watch the birds fly by, and no, I am not going to be sacrificing an animal to look at its liver. However, 
Uh, even though the Romans did not have a monopoly on divination, I'm still counting this as a Roman custom because I didn't think to do this until I was preparing for these videos. So I'm not going to be using Roman methods, I'm going to be using the methods of divination that I like to engage with, and that is primarily astrology and tarot. So I will be doing a tarot reading just for myself on the morning of my wedding, and I have already cast a chart for my wedding. Uh, I will not share that with you here, but it looks pretty good. Sun in its rulership, moon in its rulership, Venus in my natal Venus, and uh, so on and so forth. It's looking pretty great, uh, to be honest. So yeah, I will be doing uh, a little bit of divination before my wedding, just as was common in ancient Rome. And even though we don't have a ton of evidence for the taking of omens before a wedding, the Romans did divination before every major thing. It was a regular feature, not just of religious festivals, but of governmental business. Omens were taken before you took a major vote in the Senate. Omens were taken before you decide to declare war, and then again when you're preparing to leave for war, and then again before all major battles. It was a major part of Rome's religious life to try and interpret what the gods might be saying to them. So it was almost certainly a feature of Roman weddings, even if we don't really know too much about it. So yes, I will be taking some omens in my own way, and I would encourage you, if you want to do this as well, pick a divination style you like. If you're into tassiomancy, do tassiomancy. You know, it, it's not so much about the method, it's about, you know, why you're taking omens in the first place. So those are the three customs that I chose to incorporate into my own wedding from ancient Rome, not counting things that I was doing anyway, like wearing an engagement ring. Now I want to move on to three customs from ancient Roman weddings that I will absolutely be avoiding. I'm sure you can guess what some of these are already. Let's start with my least favorite Roman wedding custom ever, which is the abduction pageant. I'm sorry, I cannot talk about this objectively. This just sucks and I'm not doing it. For those of you who have not seen the other videos in this series, there was a point in the Roman wedding procession where the bride would be kidnapped or abducted. I'm putting it in quotes because it was not meant to be real. It was a staged abduction where she was supposed to be hauled off kicking and screaming into her husband's house. Emphasis on kicking and screaming because it was better if she was more upset, more tears, more lamenting, more wailing and throwing herself on the ground saying, I'm not going. This is a terrible custom. Yeah, I mean, again, it's like a Sabine thing, a reference to the abduction of the Sabine women, but I mean, like, no, this is terrible. Don't do this. Okay. I'm sorry I cannot be objective about that, but... I'm not here to tell you that Roman culture is 100% awesome and we should emulate it in every way. So that's the first custom that I am obviously going to have nothing to do with. The second custom that I'm going to be avoiding, or I guess avoiding is the wrong word here, but not doing, is propitiating the lares. In Rome, uh, for a bride, the wedding day was the day when she left her parents' house and moved into a new house with her husband. And so the bride would be leaving her birth family behind, and that includes the household gods of her ancestors, the lares, the penates, the ancestors themselves. Not to say that they never would have looked over her again, but... When a girl got married, she was officially giving up those household gods, which meant that she was no longer making offerings to them, and she could no longer guarantee that they were going to protect her and look out for her. The whole wedding day is a liminal time for the bride, because once she leaves that house and leaves the protection of those lares, she has to go all the way across town or wherever she was going to the new household, which also had a set of lares that she's meeting for the first time. So she has to provide an offering to those lares in the hope that they will accept her. 
So the bride carried with her during the procession three coins. One was for her husband, and then the other two were for Lares. One for his household Lares, and one for the Lares of his neighborhood. Um, so there were private Lares and public Lares. She would have needed to make an offering to both. Although I'm assuming if they lived in the same neighborhood, maybe it would have just been two coins, and the neighborhood Lares maybe need not be appealed to on this day. So I'm not doing this because unlike Roman brides, this is not as much of a life transformation for me. It obviously is a transition in my life. It obviously is a big deal. But I moved out of my parents' house in 2012, and I have been living in this house for a few years, and this is where I'm going to live after I get married. So, you know, it, it's not like I am leaving behind my household and my family. Uh, I have been an independent adult for a long time, so this just doesn't really apply to my life. And I think that's true of a lot of modern American brides. Um, it's just not something that I would need to do. Um, I also would not need to um, put up certain protections for once I'm in the house, but before I've been officially accepted by the Lares. Roman brides uh, may have done this custom where they spread wolf's fat over the door um, and hung garlands of wool uh, to keep them safe. No one's really sure why wolf fat. It might be like a reference to Romulus and Remus being nursed by the she-wolf. And I wonder if it also didn't have something to do uh, with maybe the, the bride as the new symbol of motherhood and nursing her children. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but wolf's fat and wool would have been hung on the doorway. I'm not doing that either. Practical considerations aside, um, I don't know where I would source wolf fat if I wanted it, which I don't, but um, even if I could get my hands on it, again, this is just something that doesn't apply to my life, so I'm not doing it. And then the last custom that I'm avoiding, this is cheating a little bit because most people where I'm from don't do this anymore, but that is the exchange of dowry uh, and all of the paperwork that went along with that. Our wedding was not pre-arranged by my father, and there need not be an exchange of dowry. Again, just like propitiating the Laris, this is just something that doesn't apply to my life, and I think this is basically universal where I live. Nobody does this anymore um, because the meaning of marriage has shifted from antiquity to now. And so these kinds of formal things are not really necessary. So those are three of the customs that would have been seen at Roman weddings but will not be seen at my wedding. Uh, it was kind of hard to pick just three because there's a lot of stuff that is just not either culturally appropriate or it's just not something that I'm interested in or doesn't apply to my life. So there were a lot of things. I could have said, you know, I'm not being carried over the threshold. There's a lot to choose from or to not choose. Uh, and so I just picked three for the sake of this video. I do want to give an honorable mention to the flameum, the veil. So I will not be veiled on my wedding day, but I am... Uh, incorporating the color scheme of Roman bridal costume into the decor and the bridesmaids' dresses and everything. Uh, my color is orange, just shades of burnt orange, which is not exactly the color of the flamam, but it's pretty close. I know this is kind of a stretch, which is why I just put it as an honorable mention, but as I was putting these videos together, I was like, wait a minute, those are my colors. That's, you know, it's close enough where I was like, I got to put it in there somewhere that I'm doing orange for the wedding. So in general, the customs from ancient Rome that I'm going to be bringing into my wedding all seem to do with spirituality and uh, the symbolism, the kind of mystical stuff that goes on. The ancestors, the divination, these are all things that 
are more spiritual in nature. And the customs that I'm avoiding all have to do with this major, 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 all-encompassing life transformation that a wedding would have been for a Roman bride, because it's just not my life. Um, I'm not the age that a Roman bride would have been. I'm twice the age, if not more than twice the age of Roman brides. Um, I would have had 17 children by now if I lived in ancient Rome. So the situation is just not the same for me as it would have been back then. So there's no need for my family to arrange a dowry. There's no need to do this abduction pageant because I'm not sad about having to leave my entire life behind because I'm not leaving my entire life behind. And I hope after watching this video, you'll get a sense of some of the similarities and the differences between our culture and Roman culture. You know, it is common among classicists, and I tend to agree with this, to emphasize the similarities. But when it comes to weddings, this is something that is just very different from anything that I can imagine. You know, when I pictured my wedding day growing up, I did not envision any of this stuff, even just not wearing white on my wedding day. You know, that was something that, I mean, everybody wears white, right? Isn't that what we do? In general, though, Roman weddings are still pretty enigmatic for us. We really don't know as much as we would like to about Roman weddings. Again, I would recommend Karen Hirsch's book if you want to know as much as we can know about Roman weddings. Uh, it's a really good step-by-step -step breakdown of what it would have been like and all of the cultural stuff that goes into it. So again, I recommend that. And again, I'll put the citation down below. And feel free to check out all of the primary source material that I link down there as well. So on that note, uh, thank you for watching. If you like this video, if you found it helpful or informative, you can let me know by leaving a thumbs up. If you like this kind of content or if you're interested in Greek and Roman belief, generally speaking, uh, especially magic, but spirituality, uh, religion, philosophy in general, uh, feel free to subscribe to this channel. I post stuff all the time on here, but I'm not going to be posting for the next couple of weeks because I'm getting married, if you couldn't already tell. So uh, feel free to subscribe. I will be back in the fall posting lots of spooky season content. Very, very excited about all of that. So thank you again so much for watching. I really, truly appreciate you. I'm gonna go get married, so I will see you on the other side of that threshold.